everybody. I, my name is Michele Antonella. I'm a professor of vascular surgery and I'm speaking from the University Hospital of Padua. And uh, as you can see on the other side, there is uh, Prof. Manuel Alonso Perez. We are both vascular surgeons and um, in this uh, webinar or web seminar, we are going to try to, sh to show you our experience on uh, using cover stand for complex ortho lesion. And uh, the real goal will be to, to show you, to share with you uh, our knowledge, some technical tips and tricks that we use. So maybe you can uh, take some something home in viewing our, our experience and showing you about a couple of cases. A couple of cases in which we are present you some issue some technique uh, some particular problem that uh, we usually face and how we are able to solve them and uh, i don't know if you're able to see the the agenda but first will be a very nice presentation from prof uh, alonso perez which will uh, show us some new uh, data coming from literature about this type of solution that we will use and then I will present my cases and then Prof. Alonso Perez will show his, uh, his cases. So I think, uh, Manuel, that we can start uh, this session. I don't know if you want to add some few words for, for the audience. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, 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 it's a pleasure for me uh, to share with all of you this session about this interesting topic. And uh, I think uh, that uh, we are ready to go. So uh, when you decide, we can begin with my presentation. Can I have my presentation? It's about uh, uh, treatment of complex aortiliac uh, obstructive disease. I am going to show you some evidence from the literature. And uh, as everybody knows, uh, open surgery is the gold standard for uh, treatment of extensive or celiac occlusive disease. However, indications are an evolving concept. And uh, nowadays, uh, recent guidelines consider that uh, for high-risk patients, at least, uh, uh, endovascular treatment is uh, the first choice for uh, uh, treatment of our celiac occlusive disease. And also guidelines consider that this procedure can be performed as a first line therapy in a standard risk patients whenever these procedures are performed by an uh, experienced team and uh, whenever these endovascular procedures do not compromise any subsequent surgical intervention. Well, in 1986, Nikolai Volodos was the first one performing endovascular treatment of an occluded iliac segment with a self-expanding cover stand. And uh, 10 years later, Bates and Marin reported the advantages of cover stands over bar metal stands for uh, treating uh, occlusive disease at the iliacs with fewer interstand restenosis with, uh, and these cover stents had no impact, of course, over the intima hyperplasia that occurs at the ends of the stem. This is a well-known trial. This is the COVID trial, a prospective multi-sender randomized control trial that compares cover stents with uh, bar expandable cover stands for the treatment of our celiac occlusive disease. And in summary, it says that cover stands provides better results for more complex lesions for task C and D lesions. And they have similar results when we are treating task D lesions. Even more, cover stands are associated to lower complication rates with uh, lower dissections, rupture, and embolization complications. And the, these results are maintained over time. The five-year primary patency rate is 75% with cover stents 
uh, uh, against 62% patency rate for bar metal stents. And the secondary patency rate is 96% and 74% respectively. So nice results with cover stents in this kind of, in this kind of lesions. And then this is another paper quite similar to the previous one. It, it comes from Padua, from uh, Professor Antonello and Michel Piazza. And uh, in, they uh, have uh, concluded in this study that cover stents are the first-line treatment for those patients with a complete iliac axis occlusion. occlusion. Uh, it means those patients with combined common iliac and external iliac occlusion. So this is also an important information. And this is a very recent comment from a recent paper published a few months ago. This is, uh, is about the iliac uh, registry. The iliac registry is a registry performed in Italy, including 11 centers with the objective to know which is the best cover stand or which is the best stand for treatment of iliac occlusions. This paper did not reach any, uh, any clear uh, result about that, but this is a uh, an interesting paper because this is a real life uh, experience showing that we are treating more and more complex lesions. We are treating more task C and D lesions using more frequently cover stands for this type of, uh, of lesions. And uh, this is the first report of the CERAB results. Uh, in, in two, sorry, in 2018, they reported the three-year outcomes with a primary patency rate 82% and secondary patency rate with, it, with this technique 97%. Also very nice results. And the, the same authors reported this very interesting study. Uh, and the, uh, in the conclusions, they mentioned that Serap technique could be the best option for reconstruction of the aortic bifurcation. When, uh, well, from my point of view, there is no evidence to say that because it, this firstly, this is an uh, in vitro study. And secondly, they did not consider a self-expanding cover stand like uh, Biaban. They just consider bar self-expandable stands, uh, ballon expandable cover stands and serap technique. So the conclusions that we can reach from this study are that kissing bar self-expandable stands has the highest confirmation ratio and that the serat technique has the lowest radial mismatch. So uh, in order to know what happens in real world with the serat technique, the first patient was enrolled in this uh, global serat study. And uh, so soon we will have uh, some more information about uh, this technique in the real situations in daily practice. But in any case, uh, I would like to make a comment about this technique. And uh, we must take into account that when we are treating patients with serap technique, sometimes we are over treating these patients uh, because we are covering perhaps uh, too much length of the aorta. And in some cases, we are sacrificing some important branches like uh, we can see in the picture, the inferior mesenteric artery has disappeared after this treatment. On the other hand, uh, very good results has, uh, have been reported with the kissing stand technique nowadays. And this is a paper published in Journal Vascular Surgery 2017, comparing our bifemoral bypass with the kissing stenting technique. And uh, at six years, 
the primary patency rate, the secondary patency rate, and the freedom from reintervention were similar between these two groups, aorto bifemoral bypass and kissing stent. So very nice result also with this uh, kissing stenting technique. And even more, an interesting data in this paper is that the only independent predictor for poor results was the presence of critical leg ischemia, not, the, the, not other uh, variables. And this is the last uh, paper I found uh, about uh, this uh, issue, about this subject. And it comes also from Padua. It's written by Mikel and uh, it was published last year in Journal Vascular Surgery. They compare open surgery repair with endovascular repair using self-expanding cover stents in low risk patients with the severe lesions, TAC C and D arteriac lesions. In 114 patients at five years, the primary patency rate was similar between these two groups. 87% primary patency rate in the open surgery group compared to 81% in the endovascular group. So these authors conclude that in the case of severe arteriac obstructive disease in low risk and young patients, endovascular repair can be considered as valid as open repair. However, for female patients, we, we must take uh, some more caution because open surgery remains the, the preferred uh, treatment uh, in these uh, women. We began our experience uh, with uh, endovascular treatment uh, at the iliacs uh, some years ago with these uh, nice results uh, when we began our experience with bar self-expanding stents. And so far from January to 2015, we have been treating more than 400 cases, 113 patients with uh, task D lesions were treated, were treated during a period of three years from 2015 to 2017. And of them, 39 patients had a complete iliac axis occlusion the occlusion of the common iliac and the sternal combined. And we report midterm results in this paper in Annals of uh, Vascular Surgery. We use in these uh, cases kissing stenting in 67% of the cases. We perform uh, common femoral artery and arterectomy in 74% of the cases. I think uh, that this is, this, uh, this technical uh, aspect is very important in order to get uh, better patency rates. And we achieve 100% technical success with 30 day mortality, 2.6%. One patient died due to severe comorbidities. And the primary patency rate at two years is 94%. The secondary patency rate, 97%. So we are uh, happy with the, our results in these cases using this technology. So to conclude, I would say that uh, the Gold Company provides cover technologies nowadays for treatment of uh, severe or iliac lesions, task C and D lesions. We have the BBX and the Biaban. The Biaban is uh, a well-known cover stent since 1996. It has been implanted in more than 500,000 cases with more than 2,000 publications showing its durability. And it has also some important features for uh, that makes this uh, cover stent and a good election uh, treating these cases. It's very flexible, high, high flexibility, and this is also the longest self-expanding cover stand in the market at the moment. And it is available in a wide range of sizes with diameters from five to 13 millimeters and length from 2.5 centimeters to 25 centimeters. 
And since 2017, we have available the new uh, BBX. This is a balloon expandable covered stand with independent stainless steel rings, providing more flexibility and conformability. It's, uh, this covered stand is assembled over a balloon with an ultra thin PTFE cover that improves the stand retention and improves uh, precision during the deployment. Also, this uh, balloon is a semi-compliant balloon that permits inside to diameter customization that can be very useful in some cases also. And of course, this uh, cover stand is available in a wide range of diameters and lengths from 15 millimeters in length to 79 uh, millimeters in length. This is the longest uh, cover balloon, col uh, balloon covered stand available uh, in the market now. And the diameter ranges from five to 11, uh, to 11 uh, millimeters. So to sum up, I would say that hybrid and pure endovascular treatment of severe or tuiliac occlusive disease is feasible nowadays with good, with good results. And at least at short and mid-term, uh, the results are quite nice. And the new BBX is the perfect complement to self-expanding biavan, allowing for a complete treatment of those cases. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. I think that you show us really, really clear the data coming from the literature. And uh, for us it, nowadays, this type of treatment using cover stand, because the data support us in using cover stand, because we can really reach results that are comparable to open repair. But there is only one uh, I mean point that is, is still not clear what to do, especially in women, because uh, we have seen in our experience that uh, when we use Biaban cover stand, uh, in which the diameter of the cover stand is less than seven, the results in terms of durability, uh, primary and secondary patency is not so, so good. So it is the same in your experience. So in young ladies, maybe you still prefer open surgery or you're pushing for an endovascular approach because sometimes, in, when we discuss the cases, we, we, we say, why don't doing an hybrid approach? So uh, putting a patch in the common femoral, so we have a, a larger common femoral and then deploying a seven or eight millimeter diameter, even if the iliac is less than seven. So try pushing the endovascular approach. Is this something that uh, is good for you or you still believe that open surgery has a role here? We have exactly the same experience and the same results in women with the small iliac arteries. So uh, from my point of view, uh, the best approach for the patient is considering the risk of the patient. If, a women, if women with a standard risk, I would prefer and the small iliac arteries, I would prefer open surgery. But in those cases with severe, uh, severe comorbidities, uh, we can do endovascular, uh, endovascular treatment exactly as you mentioned, trying to perform a patch at the, at the common femoral artery, trying to increase the diameter of this artery. So trying to, to, to improve the outflow because this is a problem with small arteries, of course, uh, minimal hyperplasia can be a problem, including the, the reconstruction. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we can start showing you the, the first case. And uh, I have to say that now, if you want, during my case presentation or Alonso uh, presentation, you can text some question with the email. So, uh, we can read to the email and answer to, uh, to the questions uh, that you have, because sometimes maybe we are not so clear as we would like to be. So please 
make uh, any questions you need, any question uh, that you that you desire. And remember that this, there's not any stupid questions. Questions are questions, so we are very happy to to try to answer to to all of you. So my case will be about uh, a passion, which is uh, for us a very young passion because he is 57 years old. Who is an active smoker and he's still smoking. So maybe we we have to improve our uh, speaking with uh, with the patients. He has some uh, standard risk of factor. He is dyslipidemia, and uh, the problem he has that he has a, a claudication that was at the beginning a very mild claudication. So we performed this NGCT that shows an occlusion of the common and the external iliac artery and said well, we have to wait because. There's not a clear indication, but the patient still smokes a lot. And uh, after six months, he comes to the to our department and says that uh, now he was not able to walk more than 10 meters. So he complained because the quality of life was not so good. And uh, we decided to, to schedule him from, uh, for a surgery. And uh, so the problem here, the key point, of course, that we have a long lesion, which is more or less 17 centimeters in length. So we have a very long occlusion of the quite all the common and all the uh, external iliac artery. We don't have any patency of the hypogastric. So this is something maybe that uh, is, is better for us. And as type of lesion here, we have a clear type D lesion. And so the option that we have that we can go for open surgery, that we standard uh, approach and uh, or endovascular treatment. So nowadays what we do in our daily practice is to perform as first line treatment, always an endovascular approach. And this even in young patient because the results as Manuel showed us before of uh, of our experience clearly shows that even in low risk patients, so young patients, the results are very good. And uh, it means that if you look at the primary patency rate we have is more or less the same to open surgery. So there's not difference between endovascular approach and open surgery in young patient, but we, with the endovascular approach using cover stent, of course, we have a less invasive procedures. So, the quality of life of this patient is much more higher respect after an open approach. So we prefer to offer to those patients uh, a mini invasive approach so they can start working before and do all their activities. And even if you look after five years at the, the, any freedom from reintervention, there's not big difference between open and endovascular approach. So we are really confident in uh, offer to young patients an endovascular approach using cover stand as a first line approach. And uh, to obtain a very clear and good results, in my opinion, even in, in this lesion, which are not simple lesion, all those cases, in my opinion, are very complex one. We have to perform a very accurate planning. So we use usually Terricom because what we need to know perfectly is the length of the lesion. So we can decide how many stands of the length of the cover stands we have to use. And then we have to be extremely accurate in know which is the diameter of the common iliac artery. Here we have nine millimeter and distally. And distally the diameter is seven millimeters. So we have only two millimeter in, in this match. So we know that when we treat those lesion, we, we have to go from 10 more or less to, to eight like, uh, like stand graft. Then we have to look carefully at the proximal landing zone where we have to deploy our stand ground pro proximally. Here we have the opportunity to land inside the common be because we have a seven millimeter room of common iliac artery, but we do not have so a lot of space where to deploy our stand ground. So in this scenario, our first indication is to use a balloon expander or cover stand because we have to be extremely precise, not to be too much inside the aorta so we can occlude the other, of course, uh, common iliac artery. And uh, in our experience, the best one is the VDX. 
as we said before, the VDX is very flexible. You can conform. So in this type of lesion, we use, as we can see later, the VDX and then the Weimar. In long lesion, we use the self-expanding. And usually, we deploy the self-expanding until the epigastric artery. This is very important because the external iliac artery is very flexible. So we need the flexible stent block with good royal force to avoid any kinking. And so if we have to avoid kinking the, from the stent graft and the artery, the most uh, appropriate zone to avoid kinking between the stent graft and the artery is clear, very, very, very near to the epigastric artery. Second, the approach we use is is if we can a percutaneous approach. So with the angio CT, always look at the, how is the common femoral. The VBX has some very, very peculiar characteristics. First, in my opinion, which is very important, is that the stent graft is very well attached to the balloon. So even in this type of lesion, if we have an occlusion, some calcification, it is quite impossible to, to see, to experience any detachment between the stent graft and the balloon before the deployment. And the second one, as Manuel showed us before, that we can shape and customize the diameter of, uh, of our VBX, especially of the 8L, which is the most used in our experience because we can go from 8 millimeter to 16 millimeter. So we can really adapt the diameter of the stent graft into the anatomy of our patient. Then to perform a percutaneous approach is very important in this type of lesion, which we have an occlusion of all the external iliac artery to, to see if we have enough room to make a puncture, to point our introducer sheets and to have some rooms to play with the guide wire and catheter. And here, so it's very, very important to, to perform an accurate planning. And we have four centimeters of common femoral arteries. So because I don't like to, to puncture the SFA. So usually we puncture the, the distal common femoral artery and here we have enough room to, to perform a percutaneous approach. So let's see the case. The case start with the echo guided puncture of the common femoral artery. Then we insert the guide wire and on the right side, we put an eight French sheets and on the contralateral side, we put the six French sheets with a pigtail. So we have all the stuff here now in place to, to start our procedures. First, angel. With the angel, we mark, of course, the common iliac arteries. And then we see all the room that we have into the common femoral and external iliac artery. As first attempt, usually we always try a retrograde approach. This is something that we do, even say if sometimes we don't believe too much, because if you are particularly lucky, sometimes you can recanalize much more easy your, your uh, iliac axis, but this is not the case. So what to do? So we leave a bench time there just to mark where is the, the artery, and then we come First, we always try an uh, anti-grade recanalization coming from the contralateral artery. Here we use a, a rim catheter and uh, because we have enough room to perform the contralateral recanalization. So we play with the guide wire from the, from, from the anti-grade and retrograde approach. And then when we, we have performed the recanalization, we try to snare the guide wire from the contralateral axis. And sometimes it's not easy to understand if we are in the same plane. So we have to rotate accurately our C arm to understand if you are in the, in the same plane. And so we can have a meeting point between the two guide wire and using a snare. Once we are secure about this, this takes sometimes of course and uh, once we are in the same plane we can snare the guide wire as you can see here and once we have snared the guide wire we can retract and capture the guide wire from the other from the, in this case from the right axis so we have a two and two so now we have performed the recanalization and we can be 
sometimes more more relaxed, but not not too much. Then to be sure of being exactly and always into the true lumen, we do what we call a kissing catheter. So we, again, the movie, we put a Bernstein from the right. So we have two kissing catheter at the level of the, of the aortic bifurcation. And then we push these two catheter above. So now really we are sure that we are with both catheter in the lumen, we attract the guide wire and we check. As you can see here with this angel, we check and we are very sure to be intraluminal. So there's not any possibility to be uh, subintimal or whatever. We are intraluminal. So we can go on in a very safe way uh, performing our procedures. We put a stiff guide wire using a nanplus. We do the angel to see how is distally and proximally the iliac axis, and then we start with the procedures. As you can see here, first we deploy the VBX, it's 8L in 70 millimeters in length, and there's not the need to protect the VBX insertion with uh, any kind of destination or flex or whatever, because the stent is really fixed with the balloon. So as you can see here, there's no disconnection and the stand graph goes up very, very good without any prey dilatation. Then we deploy the stand graph. Here you cannot see exactly the movie. Okay, doesn't matter. What I would like to underline that when the VDX open, you see a very good dog bone. Sometimes using other cover stand, the dog bone is not so clear. Here is very clear. So when we have deployed the stand graph, then we we control distally and uh, we sign in the screen where we have to land with the via band here, very close to, to the epigastric artery because in this point, the, the artery is fixed. So it's not possible to have any thinking or other stories between the stand graph and, and the artery. So we deploy the Viban, as you can see here, and this is the results. We always balloon the Viban with an eight millimeter uh, balloon in diameter, and then to adapt the VBX into the common iliac artery, which was more or less nine millimeter in diameter, 9.1, if I remember well. We always post dilate the VBX using uh, a uh, power flex or optopro balloon, which is a compact balloon in, in the diameter here of the compact balloons is 10 millimeters. So we can really shape, as you can see here, the VBX in a conical way. So we have very good adaptability of the stent graph into the artery. So it's, it's sort of customization of the diameter that we need or the diameter that really that, that we want. And this is the final results. The final results, so you can see before the procedures and after the procedures. And this is not the end of the procedures. What we do always in this type of lesion, which are long lesion, is always to, to check. It means that we check the, we always took a final angiograms without guide wire with a, a very forced leg flexion, as you can see here. As much as we can in the operating room, sometimes it's not possible to do 90 degree, but we always try to be very close to 90 degrees. So to see if there is any kinking, as you can see here of the Viban or between the Viban and the common femoral artery, but I repeat, as you can see here, even in flex position, everything is fine. There is not kinking. There is good distal runoff, good proximal runoff. Here we have a conical shape of the VBX, one centimeter of overlapping zone. So here we are very, very happy with the, with the procedures. Thank you very much for, for your attention. So I hope uh, that everything was fine and clear with my presentation. So if you have any questions, please send some emails so we can we can see if you have any doubt or, or, or other things.
Do you have any comment, Manuel, uh, on these cases? Well, no. firstly, uh, congratulations for your uh, case. It's an excellent case with very nice results. And I have a question about uh, what uh, is uh, your opinion about uh, the brachial access? When do you uh, uh, prepare the arm in order to get a uh, brachial access from above? Uh, because perhaps in some cases can be an alternative. What's your opinion? So, but usually we use a lot of the brachial access. Typically when we, we do not have any kind of small room in the common iliac artery. So if we have an occlusion, a bilateral occlusion, or if we have an occlusion at just at the origin of the common iliac, we prefer to start with, uh, with the brachial axis because it's more easy to, to perform the recognition from an anti-grade approach respect to retrograde because yeah. retrograde, you do, you do know anything. If you're intraluminal, see the inter intraluminal, you see the gut wire everywhere. So <laughs> sometimes we have made, of course, some dissection of the distal uh, aorta. So this is not very nice. So we prefer in bilateral lesion or when the lesion is, we have, less than uh, four or five millimeters in the common, we prefer a brachial axis, definitely. Okay, I That's think right. that we, you can go on with, with your case. That's right. Okay. Ready? Well, uh, I'm let me to show you a video about uh, endovascular treatment of iliac occlusion. This is a 69 year old male with typical risk factors for atherosclerosis. And uh, he's complaining of uh, left lower limb severe claudication with no improvement despite best medical treatment due to a uh, left iliofemoral occlusion, as we can see here in this Doppler study with the right patency and uh, left iliac occlusion with an ankle brachial index 0.58. This is the preoperative CT, uh, diffuse calcification of the aorta, more severe at the distal aorta, near close to the bifurcation, huge inferior mesenteric artery patent, and the occlusion of the left uh, common iliac with severe calcification, diffuse disease of the external iliac artery with calcification. The right iliac axis has classification with no severe stenosis and the left common femoral artery, some plaques severe, calcified plaques uh, with severe stenosis. The femoropopletial sector is uh, quite nice, uh, some plaques with no severe stenosis. This is the infrarenal aorta, 16 millimeters in diameter, severe calcification without thrombus. The right iliac axis, also diffuse calcification, but no significant disease. The right common femoral artery, some plaques and some calcium without uh, no severe stenosis. And uh, the left iliac axis uh, with severe calcification and occlusion of the left common iliac of 5.7 centimeters, diffuse disease in the external iliac artery and uh, uh, the uh, hypogastric is also we is also severe calcifi calcified with the stenosis the left common femoral artery uh, has an stenosis more than 50 percent with calcium these are details of the bifurcation artery bifurcation mild mild stenosis at the origin of the right common iliac severe calcification of both iliac axes. These are the external uh, arteries diameter. And this is the 3D reconstruction of the preoperaticity with severe calcification of the distal aorta, patency on the right side, left side with severe occlusions uh, and the disease mainly on the common iliac artery. So we decide to perform in this case left common femoral artery and arterectomy with kissing stenting at the aortic bifurcation using the BBX 8L per 79 millimeters and uh, completing the procedure, we deploy uh, a via band 8 per 150 millimeters covering all the length of the axis down to the common femoral artery. So we prepare both groins 
with open exposure on the left side. And we try initially, as it uh, has already been mentioned, we try a retrograde recanalization without success in this case. But this is the first step. We try to go intraluminally, of course, but uh, it was not possible. So after several attempts, we moved to the right groin with puncture of the common femoral artery, performing an angio, and uh, tried an anterograde recanalization from the contralateral side. We can see severe calcification of these vessels. We can see here there's a small stamp on the left common iliac and a mild stenosis at the origin of the right common iliac. So we try first an integrated recanalization using the only flash catheter. It was uh, unsuccessfully this attempt because the uh, only flash is a very soft catheter. So we exchange this catheter for a SIM1 catheter, a stiffer one, and it didn't work either. So we tried several times. We exchanged the same catheter for another catheter, Sheffer hook, the same problem. It was unsuccessful, this attempt. So we decide to go back to the left groin and perform a retrograde recanalization attempt. Uh, we in this case we are going subintimally and we can see how it's impossible to go into the aortic lumen we can see the movement of the calcified aorta and both iliacs with the multipurpose wire pushing upwards the guide wire is uh, subintimal in this uh, these arteries are dissected so we decide to use uh, a reentry device, in this case, the Outback over an O14 guide wire, and easily we go into the uh, aortic lumen. But we have the problem because we are going with a multipurpose catheter over an O14 guide wire, so the hole is very small, the, the bifurcation is calcified, we predilate with a PTA balloon for per 40 millimeters, and then easily we go with the multipurpose inside the aortic lumen over the uh, thrombo wire. We exchange the thrombo wire for amplas, and we go upwards with the with the wire. We can see the amplus wire and the common femoral artery with severe calcified lesions. We perform endarterectomy as usual. We close uh, this uh, endarterectomy with a patch. And this is a maneuver, maneuver that uh, we use sometimes. It can be helpful and very comfortable. We go through the patch with uh, the Amplus uh, guide wire, and it's very comfortable uh, when we are deploying the stents uh, without uh, any problem. So it's very useful. We can use it or not, but uh, it's uh, uh, a possibility. Now we are finishing the, the, endarter, the closure of the endarterectomy, and we usually leave a radiopaque marker at the proximal level of the endarterectomy. It's very easy to see it during the deployment, the, the deployment of the cover stents. And we go with an eight French introducer, introducer sheath into the distal aorta, for in order to deploy the to BBX 8L uh, per 79 millimeters using the kissing stand technique. The behavior of this uh, BBX uh, in this uh, position, in this severe calcified aorta, is very good, as, as uh, we can see here in this uh, picture. 
and the completing the procedure, uh, we decide to cover all the length of the left uh, iliac uh, axis down to the femoral comora uh, above the epigastrix with uh, the self-expanding biavan. We post-dilate all the iliac axis with the eight uh, millimeters PTA balloon and check for an adequate uh, dilation. And now we are going to perform flaring at the uh, distal aorta in the kissing uh, configuration with two uh, PTA balloons, uh, 12 millimeters uh, per 40 millimeters. In order to get a better apposition of the BBX at the, uh, at the aorta wall, as we can see here, the result is quite nice. This is the final angio of the procedure. After removing, in any case, always after removing, after removing the introducer sheath from the left groin, we check uh, with contrast that everything is okay in order to uh, assure uh, a good outflow. We perform percutaneous closure on the left side and a standard closure of the open groin. And uh, this patient was discharged on the third post-operative day with a dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, atorvastatin. And uh, he has bilateral uh, distal pulses and normal ankle brachial index. In, in this case, this is a detail of the postoperative CT with a nice apposition of the biavan in this calcified aortic bifurcation, right iliac axis, left iliac axis, very nice uh, result also with no any problem at the distal end of the stand and, uh, and the 3D reconstruction of this procedure. So we are quite happy with the final results. Uh, thank you very much uh, once more for your attention. We have some questions from coming from, from the internet, uh, but before, so, uh, before I would like to, to ask you um, a, couple of, a couple of questions. First, uh, in, in this case, you perform a kissing stand. So even if there is maybe the room to deploy the stent graft just in the left iliac axis without why you, you choose uh, a kissing configuration because you are you want to treat also the other stenosis or because of some calcification of the aortic bifurcation that sometimes you can make some disruption so you protect the bifurcation with the kissing configuration well, I think that there are two reasons. The first one is that we have a mild stenosis on the right side, so we decide to 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 do this uh, this technique. But also sometimes uh, when we want to preserve uh, the just one iliac uh, axis without kissing, we found that uh, when they mainly when there is a thrombus at that level. Uh, the results uh, could be not so good because as you had mentioned, when you perform an, uh, just treatment of uh, an isolated ax uh, ilia axis, uh, you must be sure that you are deploying the, the stand graft uh, uh, very close to the origin of the iliac where there should not be any lesion, thrombus or any problem. In the, on the other hand, uh, this patient has severe calcification of the distal aorta, so we decide to do that. Perhaps uh, other option could be possible, but in our experience, experience, it's better to do that. So we go ahead with that. No, no, I fully, I fully agree with you, and uh, I think that we don't have to to have the fear to perform a kissing configuration because. Uh, one of the key points, in my opinion, when we perform those type of procedures is to protect the aortic bifurcation, to reconstruct the aortic bifurcation with kissing stands in which we are going to publish some data, but with the kissing configuration, with the molding, as you show that the results, even in the geometrical configuration is wonderful. And then you protect your aortic bifurcation and you have a really wonderful inflow site. 
So this allowed us to have very good long-term results. I have another question that comes from the, from the internet, uh, especially when we have severe calcification. Sometimes we, I always over balloon the Weibann to be sure that the Weibann expand uh, very well. But uh, even if we look in more than one pro projection, sometimes we have some residual stenosis. So if uh, we have money, we, when, when we can, we use IBUS to see if the, the stand graph is fully uh, expanded or we use uh, to see the, to measure the blood pressure all along the stand graph. So if we, we see any drop of the blood pressure more than 15, we use a um, non compact balloon to expand uh, the Viaban uh, a little a little more. It, I don't know which is your experience, uh, what you do to in very severe classification, how to check after the procedures if the, the Viaban or the cover stent you use is fully expanded. Yes, uh, this point that you mentioned is very interesting because I think this is a very important message, message uh, to, to say that uh, it's not enough to just one projection to check the correct uh, uh, opening of these arteries because it depends it it's, uh, it depends mainly on the uh, characteristics of the calcification sometimes you have mainly an intraluminal calcification others uh, in other occasions you have a, a calcification of the arterial walls so I, this is Difficult. This is different, but of course, I think that you should check the final result with some of these uh, techniques that you have mentioned, because uh, it's uh, surprising sometimes that you have occlusion of uh, reconstruction that you thought it was okay, but really something happens because the patient had a problem. Okay, uh, another couple of questions for you that comes always from, from the audience. When you perform and deploy the, the VBX, usually in calcified lesion, you predilate them or not? And second question is, are you afraid in using a 12 millimeter balloon to post dilate the VBX into the aorta or not? Well, um, first, uh, 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 with re regarding uh, the, the 12 millimeters balloon, I'm not uh, worried about that because we calculate the area of the aorta and the area of the two uh, biaban, the diameter of the two biaban. So the diameter of the two biaban in this case was. Uh, approximately the same than the, the, the diameter of the aorta. So we were not worried about that. And uh, regarding the first question you mentioned? If you predilate uh, the iliac oh, axis yes. or not? Uh, depends, uh, because uh, if there is a severe calcification, I think that you should uh, predilate. But uh, however, the, if you have a great amount of thrombus, if you predilate, you can have embolization. So in those cases, I leave a big uh, introduced sheath di distally in order to avoid the uh, distal embolization when we are going percutaneously. Of course, when we, when we perform these procedures uh, in an open fashion, this is not a problem. Is it uh, right to say that this is a question that uh, also in your case, but when we have a severe calcification, to have a more stable uh, um, procedures in terms of stability of the catheter, the brachial access could be more useful or maybe using a steerable catheter from the contralateral or not? Really, in my, in my experience, uh, few few cases I use the brachial axis in this uh, the brachial axis. 
I uh, always try to perform it from below initially in a retrograde fashion. Usually I don't go, this is a, my trick, it works sometimes. I don't go with the, with the guide wire uh, very high at the level of the bifurcation. Before reaching the bifurcation, I remove the wire and go with a curve catheter, vertebral or something like that in order to get to the, to the aortic lumen. And many, many times I, do, I, I get uh, the aortic lumen. But of course, if I, it's impossible to, to get into the aortic lumen from below, you have also the, the brachial abscess that is, it, it permits uh, here huge pushability and control. And mainly when there is no a stamp at the origin of uh, the common iliac is a very useful maneuver from above and you are very comfortable doing that, of course. I, of course, I, I fully agree with you. It's, I'm very pleased to, 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 to see your cases because we work in a very similar way. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm not alone in, in this world. And um, when we face, uh, this is our approach with uh, a patent hypogastric, what the, the some, someone always asks what to do. First, uh, we always try to preserve the hypogastric. So if we need, especially to preserve the hypogastric, we do a combination of, of materials. So we do VDX, bare metal stent, and then vibrance. So we try to preserve the hypogastric. But this is something that's very important for, I say, my our brain. But in most of the time, when we we balloon the iliac axis, then we have plaque that are close to the origin of the, of the hypogastric. Maybe we preserve with the bare metal stand the hypogastric, but in a couple of months, three months, four months, there will be many times an occlusion of the hypogastric. So nowadays, if we have severe calcification, we cover the hypogastric. And what is important for us is the, the, other, the opposite. The contralateral hypogastric should be open and uh, this is another reason why we prefer the kissing configuration because when you perform a kissing stent you never cover or quite never it's very difficult to cover the inferior mesoteric apex so you always preserve the inferior mesoteric apex if you do routinely setup it's much, much more easy to cover the inferior mesenteric artery so you can have a closure of the inferior mesenteric artery and closure of the hypo hypogastric artery. So there you can have some problems. So this is our now behavior. We, we cover the hypogastric and with the kissing, we preserve the inferior mesenteric artery. I don't know if it's the same for you. Yes, I completely agree. I, I feel very comfortable when you looking at your face when you were talking about uh, leaving a, a bar stand uh, at the origin of the hypogastric with the cover stands uh, in the common and in the sternal. I don't know if, the, if this uh, technique um, is worth, I don't know, because uh, I think that in the future you can have a restenosis at that level and on the other hand, uh, you have uh, to think about that uh, in the hypogastric could be patent, but this patient has an occlusion of the hypogastric indeed above uh, uh, from the functional point of view. I mean, you have an occlusion of the iliac uh, at the common iliac and you have patent the hypogastric. So I think that from the point of view, of the patient, uh, he or she uh, doesn't uh, have any problem regarding occlusion of these hypogastrics in these uh, in these uh, patients. And um, which is usually um, the postoperative uh, therapy in your patient? Because usually we do we give those patients a double antiplatelet therapy. 
for at least we do there's not evidence coming from the literature but we do at least three months three months if it's a man eh? and six if it's a woman so completely not scientific data but this is our feeling because uh, i don't know if this data comes well from our study but in the women we have the worst results coming after one to two years not just at the beginning so maybe in those in these ladies in this patient the female patient we we need more prolonged double antiplatelet therapy really Which we is, don't know because indeed it, it, if the occlusion is at long term i don't know if uh, really the the antiplatelet therapy is the reason and regarding the post-operative treatment i think that is uh, like in any other treatment that we use in vascular surgery we don't have any evidence about the post-operative treatment of these patients we follow the recommendations uh, from cardiologists mainly and from from personal experience so i think that uh, a dual antiplatelet during three, six months uh, is okay. More than one ask us uh, uh, if we have any indication for a surgical cut down of the femoral artery. So what we do now is whatever, when we can, we, we go always percutaneous. But as uh, Manuel clearly showed us, in more than 50% of cases of our experience, we have lesion of the common. So if we have a lesion of the common and the stenosis is more than 50% of the diameter of the common femoral, we do an endarterectomy with patch. And the second uh, reason why we do a cut down of the common femoral is when we believe to have fresh thrombus into the iliac acid. It means that if the patient, I saw the patient, and uh, after one year, he said that uh, it's five days, two weeks uh, that uh, he has a worsening of his uh, limb ischemia. So I can presume that he has some thrombus. I prefer to do the cut down. So I can clamp the, the common or the SFA and the profunda and do all my procedure without any risk of distal embolization. Which is your approach? The same well, I think, I think that many of these patients uh, have a, a common femoral artery disease, and in those cases, uh, you need to, to, to get a, a better outflow. So in those cases, uh, we, we perform open. In many of our cases, we perform open uh, exposure and endarterectomy. Okay. Uh, then there is another question that was for me, maybe the last one, I don't know, that uh, it was some that was tricky also for us because we deployed an eight millimeter via band in external iliac acids that at the level of the common, if you measure, it was more or less three. And it seems that it was three. It was not thrombus or occlusion, that it was sort of hypoplastic uh, external iliac. So this is, uh, something that was not clear for us if the viaban would expand, but uh, usually in this hypoplastic artery, the viaban really is capable to expand to his luminal uh, diameter, as you said in the case, and without any particular ballooning of the viaban, really the viaban, in my opinion, is not so uh, less, ra less radial force stent, as someone said. He has very optimal radial force, so he's able to maintain the diameter that he expanded. And so we are very confident to use this type of stent graft, even in small artery. And this is what we are trying to do for women, for example, is even if the artery is six, we put a patch in the common and then we put seven or eight to over dilate the, their arteries and to, to use more larger diameter to improve, uh, to improve the, the results. So I think Manuel that we have to, to end this section. 
So I thanks you very much. And I think that we will be here again in a couple of months to discuss uh, of other some technical aspect of the this very important and this very peculiar uh, procedures. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity that uh, I enjoy a lot sharing with you this experience. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, hello everybody and see you in the next month. Bye bye.